So thanks. I'm not going to stand behind the podium for two reasons. I don't like standing static for any amount of time. And two, I'd have to change glasses to be able to read the screen. And, and then I wouldn't be able to see you. So, um, so uh, thanks very much. Um, I'm, I'm the first person here on the list, but that's just because I was given the task of leading this uh, revisiting of the uh, one of the more important of the COPE uh, guideline documents, the retraction documents, but I had a lot of help. Um, and uh, from Heather, Matt, uh, Katrina, and Jessica, I think, is everybody here to stand up if you're on the list so people know who you are? Heather, Matt, Katrina, Jessica, if you're here, yeah, great. So I had a lot of help, and I, and I, I think just as a start, it would be beneficial to give you some insight into something that Deborah mentioned about how these documents are actually prepared. Uh, because it, it really kind of, yeah, it, it gives you some important insight into how they end up the way they are. So, um, so uh, basically we decide to update this document or start a new one, and that this is an education committee, and then a group of us on the education committee are, uh, are tasked with doing this. Uh, sometimes uh, members, non-members, people from outside, are co-opted, as in this case. Uh, the document is then produced, many, many iterations, many, many iterations. You have to be resilient and patient. And then, uh, and then it goes outside the uh, education committee to the council, which is 40 strong, uh, for their comments, and then it's revised again. And then it goes to the trustees, and their comments come back, and then it's revised again. It's a long process. And the key aspects of it are important to consider that it should be as broadly applicable as possible and not prescriptive. And that's why it's called a guidance document. So that's very important. So uh, we're very close to finishing this one. We had hoped it would be finished uh, by now so that it could be handed out, but it's not. The, still some fine tuning in the wording. And so what, what I'm going to do is just go through it. Unfortunately, it's very text heavy. What, what could I do? I couldn't think of cute uh, cartoons to use. Oops, I don't like text-heavy talks, but okay, there it is. Uh, right off the start, uh, while we were uh, working on this, we decided that it wouldn't be possible to cover everything in it. So a decision was made to split out expressions of concern, letters to the editor, and commentaries into a separate guidance document, as well as a document about core agenda and errata. So those will be coming maybe in 2020. See how long that process goes. Mm -hmm. Another thing I wanted to point out here, which I didn't, <laughs> even though it was in red to remind myself, <laughs> is that we added a footnote, uh, which you can read here yourselves, uh, just to say that these uh, guidelines uh, typically have in been intended to apply to uh, primarily to journal articles, but may also be applicable to other types of publications, so book chapters, abstracts, printed, published abstracts, preprints, and other published documents. Okay. So the purpose of a retraction. Retraction is a mechanism for correcting the literature and alerting readers to articles that contain such seriously flawed or erroneous content or data that their findings and conclusions cannot be relied upon. So this is what was referred to as the, the sanctity of the uh, published record. And unreliable content or data may result from honest error, naive mistakes, or research misconduct. So the main purpose of a retraction, therefore, is to correct the literature and ensure its integrity rather than to punish the authors. And you've heard this word punish used, and we'll hear it used many times. This is not, that's not our role. So not about punishing the authors. Retractions may be used to alert readers to cases of redundant publication, plagiarism, peer review manipulation, reuse of material or data without authorization, copyright infringement, or some other legal issue, for example, libel, privacy, illegality, unethical research, and or a failure to disclose a major competing interest that would have unduly influenced interpretations or recommendations. So which publications should be retracted? If only a small part of an article reports flawed data or content, this may be best rectified by a correction. So this is really a more nuanced <coughs> follow-up to the previous slide, and it's more of what constitutes sufficient grounds to retract the whole article. 
Partial retractions are not helpful because they make it difficult to determine the status of the article and which parts may be relied upon. Similarly, if only a small section of an article, for example, a few sentences in the discussion, is plagiarized or text reused, editors should consider a correction which could note that text was used without appropriate acknowledgement and cite the source, rather than retracting the entire article, which may contain sound original data. So if repu redundant publication occurs, the journal that published first may issue a notice of redundant publication, but should not retract the article unless there are other concerns, such as the reliability of the data. Any journals that subsequently publish a redundant article should retract it and state the reason for the retraction, if an article is published in more than one journal, either online or in print, around the same time, precedence may be determined by the publication dates or the dates on which a license to publish or a copyright transfer agreement was signed by the authors. And uh, there isn't a lot of consistency in this, as we learned in our discussions. Um, what form should a retraction take? In general, a retraction notice should cover a single retracted article. And this came up because uh, of a few instances where large numbers, 40, 50, 100 articles were retracted under the same retraction notice. Retraction notices should mention the reasons and basis for the retraction to enable readers to understand why the article is unreliable, and should also specify who is retracting the article and possibly how the matter came to the journal's attention. Claimants may be named only when they have given permission. Whenever possible, editors should negotiate with authors and attempt to agree on a form of wording that is clear and informative to readers and acceptable to our, all parties. You might find that a bit strange, but you'll understand it better when I get to the legal aspects. However, prolonged negotiations should not unreasonably delay retraction and editors should punish Publish. <laughs> An editor should publish retractions even if consensus cannot be reached. Retraction notices should be published in all versions of the journal, print uh, and or online. It is helpful to include the authors and title of the retracted article in the retraction heading. And retracted articles should be unmistakably identified as such in all online sources example on the journal's website, on the original article, and in any bibliographic databases. So who should issue the retraction? In some cases, retractions are issued jointly or on behalf of the journal's owner, for example, a learned society or a publisher. However, since responsibility for the journal's content rests with the editor, they should always have the final decision about retracting material. Editors may retract publications or issue expressions of concern, even if all or some of the authors do not agree. Who is retracting the article should be clearly identified within the retracted no notice. And then how quickly should an article be retracted? This was referred to uh, <laughs> earlier when, uh, when uh, the, uh, the new uh, category of membership for universities was discussed. Um, uh, where there can be model, bottlenecks in the process uh, and a de decision is just held up for an unduly long period. So publication should be retracted as soon as possible after the editor is convinced that the publication is seriously flawed, misleading, or falls into any of the categories described in the document. Prompt retraction should minimize the number of researchers who cite the erroneous work, act on its findings, or draw incorrect conclusions, such as from double counting redundant publications in a meta-analysis or similar instances. If an editor has convincing evidence that a retraction is required, they should not delay retraction simply because the authors are not cooperative. However, if an allegation of misconduct related to a potential retraction results in a disciplinary hearing or institutional investigation, it may be appropriate to wait for the outcome before issuing a retraction but an expression of concern may be published in the interim. Okay, so I'm running out of time, so I'll go through these quickly. What should editors do in the face of inconclusive evidence about a publication's reliability? If conclusive evidence about the reliability of a publication cannot be obtained or will not be obtained for a significant period of time, retraction may not be appropriate, but an editor could consider publishing an expression of concern. 
Should retractions be applied in cases of disputed authorship? Authors sometimes request that articles are retracted when authorship is disputed after publication. If there is no reason to doubt the validity of the findings or the reliability of the data, it's not appropriate to retract the publication solely on the grounds of an authorship dispute. Can authors dissociate themselves from a retracted publication? The short answer is no. <laughs> Are there grounds for legal proceedings if an author sues a journal for retracting or refusing to retract a publication? Authors usually would not have grounds for taking legal action against a journal over retraction or an expression of concern if it follows a suitable investigation and proper procedures. And I'm going to skip that one. Republishing retracted content. An author may republish some of the work if not all of the content was found to be unreliable. In order to do so transparently, authors should notify the editors of the new journal of the prior retraction and it is likely appropriate to cite the retraction indicating why the work was flawed and what has been corrected in the new article. And that's all I wanted to say. Thank you for listening. First of all, uh, thanks for having me here uh, for the invitation. My name is Ted van Leeuwen. I work at the uh, Leiden University Center for Science and Technology Studies. And I'm going to talk to you about uh, a study we conducted. <coughs> and you see the, the, the logo of, the, of the, the project in the upper uh, right-hand corner for you. The Printiger project, where we collaborated with eight other institutions uh, on a project on research integrity. And my task was to study retracted literature from uh, the scholarly pool of data, in this case, from the Web of Science database. You see also in my list of, uh, of uh, colleagues, collaborators. Um, so let's start. <coughs> this is the outline I'm going to talk to you about re about retractions. And thanks to Howard, he already introduced that whole phenomenon to you quite explicitly, so I'm not going to go to, into much detail there. Actually, we started from a different angle, not by defining it up front, but see what we can find in the data. I talk about data collection show, of course, results, because this is an interesting uh, thing in, in, in the light of what I just talked about. Uh, some observation and discussion, and if we can get to it, about research integrity and thinking in metaphors. So that depends on the time available. Well, on retractions. You all know that there are many reasons for retracting literature. Common errors are, uh, are one of the reasons, but also plagiarism, falsification, uh, floppiness, ethical issues. And due to a number of uh, highly uh, publicized cases, particularly in the Netherlands in 2011, and I think in the afternoon we will hear more about that, this became really a big thing and also integrated in our national evaluation protocol. And it actually quite stim hardly stimulated the idea of it was the effect of individual researchers making a mess out of it, in other words, stimulated the bad effort <coughs> in the bar in the barrel uh, metaphor or perspective. So what we did in our study we looked at uh, retracted literature, and there is some prior knowledge on this. Uh, references are on the, on the sheet. And what we did, we collected all the publications from the Web of Science database in 2016. In total, we collected uh, nearly 1,800, uh, uh, 3,800 publications. And these were, these were all collected, uh, say, from a database that we had in its CWTS in-house version of the Web of Science. So a little bit different than what you all know, as your desktop facility, we have a bibliometric database that allows us to, to collect the data from that system. But please be aware that what we collect is actually a very small number of publications. So how did we actually start to work? We collected from the database all papers that had in their title a mention of the paper being retracted. And from that set, we realized, having now uh, retraction watch at, uh, at hand, is that we have probably a very small portion what's actually there in terms of retracted literature. <coughs> and before retraction watch offered uh, the notifications, we had to collect them in 2017, 16, 17. We had to collect them all manually from the internet. So this was a quite uh, laborious and tedious work, collecting them all, reading them, and distilling from them the reasons for retraction and actually the initiators of the retraction. After we had collected that, all that and started to collect also the information about initiators and reasons, we <coughs> added information from our database on geographical locations about certain countries and the institutions' names, the journal names, 
and also domains, so scientific fields. <coughs> so I bring you to some results here. If you look at the, the upper graph shows that particularly after the millennium change, the whole phenomenon of retracted literature became quickly a big issue. Um, and actually this graph also shows that there is a, some sort of a decrease in the trend of picking up retracted literature. But if you look at the lower end graph, you see that within six years, and Howard mentioned what time it should be, actually what I found is that on average within six years, publications are being retracted from the literature. But what that graph also shows is that it is given the fact that it is picked up within that time, the upper graph is showing you something that's not yet complete. So the papers that are missing in the upper hand graph are the ones that are probably not discovered as being fraudulent. So if I give you distribution over countries, um, you see that uh, there are a number of countries that are uh, on the top. And if you look at uh, the rank table, in uh, this is, by the way, not really a rank table you would like to be on, on the, in the high end of that table. Between brackets, you see the position that the country takes on a global ranking scale based on all publications. And if I put in this table in yellow the big movers, so you see that Japan, India, uh, South Korea, the Netherlands, and Iran are actually big movers or on the, on the global ranking. And I can tell you that for the Netherlands, this is due to only one or two cases. So there the Big Apple perspective is actually stimulated by all of this. If we then shift our attention to domains, you see that on top of this list, you see mostly biomedicine. And it was already mentioned earlier today uh, in, the, in the talk on predatory publishing that uh, there is probably something going on in those domains where pressure to publish is extremely high. Again, if I put in yellow those domains where you see increases in, in the rank table, and again, not necessarily a rank table you would like to be in, is that you see those domains where pressure is really high, so uh, basic life sciences, biomedical research, multidisciplinary, not, to, not forgetting that uh, high impact journals like Nature Science and proceeding of the National Academy of, of the US contain many rejections. So that actually raises the question, what about the peer review systems in those journals? Are they actually taking care of the quality or are they too eager to, to have, say, a quick scoop out? So let's move to the motivation for rejection. And I go quickly over this because what you see in red is actually all the instances we found in our study that is actually related to a certain unknown factor. And I put it on, together on one slide. And what you see basically here that about 25% of all the retracted literature we discovered relates to unknowns. So unknown because, for example, the notification did get, didn't get any clear reason why. But also, for example, we couldn't find it on the internet. Or simply our university didn't have any kind of an agreement with the publisher so we couldn't actually get in to the material otherwise than paying uh, for, the, for the retraction notification, so paying high prices for getting only the notification. We decided not to do that. So going one step further, you see, looking at the, the expected reasons, actually honest errors is about 10% of all the reasons for retraction. And then you see a long list of things that we otherwise would have classified in very straightforward terms, like uh, falsification or fabrication or plagiarism, it seemed to us much more complicated than simply teasing out those very clear reasons for uh, retraction. It, it seemed that from the retraction notifications, it was often a combination of reasons why literature was retracted. So not one single reason, but a combination. For example, fabrication and issues with statistical interpretation. What you can clearly see is that retractions are more observed in those domains where strong international comp competition is, uh, is visible and uh, rapid publication patterns, but also in those countries where we know that the scholarly system has mechanisms installed that actually uh, uh, pays off for having publications. And again, relating to the, to the talk about pub uh, predatory publishing, even in the journals in the web of science, you can see that, uh, for example, the, well, and you've seen the countries on the list, we know that China, has, for example, has a system where you get paid for, or at least it pays off, 
to have five papers in a high impact factor journal or a journal, journal impact factor journal in the first place to make a next step in your academic career. And you get $30,000 if you pay in nature or in science. So clearly stimulants that are actually should not be there. So if we look at the uh, observations on the motivations and the, the initiators, in about 55% you can say that intentional misconduct was uh, the reason for retraction. But also 10% of honest errors are there. And finally, sloppiness by scholars also still accounts for some 11%, which means not asking for permission at the ethical uh, review board, uh, authorship issues, that kind of stuff. Um, so rejection notices are written mostly by editors and publishers, uh, yeah, editors and, and or the authors. Um, the phrasing of those notifications are very often opaque, and as you've seen, also very uh, often missing. Uh, and that's, uh, that's really a pity because we cannot do proper analysis of all of this. So, a discussion. Um, and it was raised already before and also by me, to what extent is this whole thing of rejected literature related to the published or Paris culture of an academia? Um, I raised the question of the, the solidity, the robustness of the, of the peer review system of mostly high impact factor journals. And you clearly see that the, the way uh, uh, retractions are written, <coughs> it is in, very often it is simply a case of reputation management. Um, and then of, I also mentioned the fact that the damage is done by only a small number of fraudulent cases to the whole of the academic uh, world. Am I time wise? Three minutes. Three minutes, okay. I'm going to try this. <laughs> so I'm going, to skip, I'm going to skip this one. And I talked a little bit about thinking and metaphors. And it's interesting because the whole debate is actually split up in two different perspectives. So it's the idea of the bad apple in the barrel, which actually relates to being the result of one individual making a mess out of it, or the iceberg model, which actually says that it is more like a systemic issue, and what you see is actually weaving errors in the fabric of science. And the model of the iceberg says... Oh, we're too fast, so can you go back to the Sorry. follow that? <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I, I will share my slides with all of you. But we're tweeting, we're tweeting out. Okay, we're tweeting out. Too slow. Okay. 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 <laughs> So the consequence of the iceberg model is, and the model says that about 10% of the iceberg is above the water surface and 90% is below it, we worked in a study with about 4,000 publications. So that is the, the thing we can see, that 10%, which basically means if you take that iceberg model serious, and I'm more inclined to think that it's a systemic issue rather than a bad apple in the barrel perspective of life, that would mean that we are still missing 36,000 publications from Web of Science. That is, if you take the papers we found as retractions as uh, the whole system. However, if you change the whole idea and the whole the Web of Science database is our system, then all of a sudden we work with 50 million publications. That means that that's 100%. And then the iceberg model says that we have to work with about 5 million publications. And we only, fo we only found 4,000. So here we have a serious problem. What are we actually talking about? And of course, those 5 million will probably not be all fraudulent, but increasingly over the last couple of years, we have a serious discussion in many fields, in psychology and biomedicine, about the application of all kinds of statistical testing. Mm. And this is perhaps, say, a reason why we should consider this not to be an, a problem of about 10 thousands of publications, but we're, I would say, uh, think in the order of hundreds of thousands, in the order of millions, perhaps. So I'm going to talk about this from a publisher's perspective and very much a publisher, as in Elsevier is a publisher, but also I'm one individual working for a company. So it's also my personal perspective, and I'll give you a bit of like the context of where you know how I deal with retractions and my my role in retractions. So I think you know I'm preaching to the choir on this one, right? Obviously, in this room, I don't really need to explain this to anyone, but um, just to reiterate, you know, this is why we find this important. Yeah. Um, because part of, you know, I know some people get nervous about retractions thinking it's going to, um, it's going to um, undermine people's, you know, if the general public see papers being retracted, that that's going to make them feel like science can't be trusted. <coughs> that is certainly not my perspective or Elsevier's perspective, is that it's part of the process of 
um, earning trust is to show that when there mm -hmm. is, when we find out about a mistake, that we that we correct it and we do it in a transparent way. Yeah. Um, and this is a bit our context, which may be completely different from your context, depending on what journal you work on or what, what company you work for. But just to give you a sense of sort of <coughs> the way we organize things a certain way based on sort of the si our size and the way we work. And part of that is that um, our journals are you know distributed across. There's many people working on them. There, we have about 5,000 editors in chief. Um, about 200 production staff, about 150 publishers. So that means a large amount of people who ideally want to keep up to speed on ethical policies, retraction policies, retraction procedures, um, who you know need to learn new code, retraction guidelines, um, and that is really hard. And it's not because people aren't motivated. I find you know particularly editors are extremely interested and motivated to know about ethics. Of course they are, but the reality is that a lot of editors will hardly ever. You know, some of them will hardly ever get an ethics allegation or will almost never, once in five years, get a retraction request. So the tricky thing is with all of these people is keeping people up to speed. So we work a little bit on the basis that we have to almost assume that our staff or our editors, if they get a retraction request or they get an ethics allegation, it might be their first time or it might, only, you know, might be their second or third time. And we have to sort of work on that basis that we try to support people that they may not be experts because thankfully, you know, most people, it's not happening every day. So this is our goal, which of course fits exactly with the, with the code guidelines and also something Ted mentioned about, you know, retracted articles being accessible. So one of our principles is once once the paper's retracted, and we put this, I think you talked about, was it, what was the word you used about, unambiguous, or it should be clear it's retracted, right? So we try to make it very clear. And then authors often don't like how clear we make it. So they often ask, can you not have that big red, you know, um, watermark, or can you not have retracted in caps? And actually, I'd much prefer it would be withdrawn. So Embo Journal, who just moved over to using withdrawals in certain cases, I promise you, it's true. Authors much prefer the word withdrawn than retracted. Um, so it's too clear for some people, but we try to make it very clear. So the article, if, it's, if it would normally be a subscription article when it's retracted, we make it openly available. So if anyone wants to find out anything about the article or question the retraction, it's all there. So this is the goal. Fair, making it fair, and I'll come back to that. That's actually a very simple word, and in reality, extremely complicated to do. Uh, clear, of course. Accurate, again, easy to say, harder to do. And then trying to get fair, clear, and accurate, and also timely. And that's something I think you know sometimes people forget. If you do this process properly, and you want to have proper retraction notices that are clear, that are fair to everybody, if you want to follow the correct process, give the authors the chance to explain themselves, that does take time. And sometimes we're probably guilty of doing things more slowly because we're trying to do it right, then get criticized for doing it um, too slowly, but then if you make a mistake, you get criticized for making a mistake. And this is just in case you think, you know, I'm humble bragging that we make mistakes. Yes, we make mistakes. And the bigger the mistake, the bigger the Elsevier logo that they use on, on the website. <laughs> Fair enough, right? Um, and, and that happens. Um, and that is not our goal, of course, but it does occasionally happen. Um, just to say in the kind of wider context, also we tend to find that retractions get a lot of attention. So then they also kind of prey heavily in editors' minds sometimes, that as if retraction is the only way to correct the record. Mm -hmm. And um, so sometimes we also need to just guide editors to say, look, it's, you know, if you decide to retract, you know, it's your decision, but just be aware you know, these are some other options that might be applicable depending on the situation. And then we have very, very unusual, like maybe for us about eight times a year, but you know, we're quite big, um, where we actually remove, we don't keep the full text. Mm -hmm. And the reason we don't keep the full text is usually something like, patient privacy, that there's photographs of the patient, um, that the patient has then decided they don't want to be available, or that turns out they didn't give proper consent for, or something like that. So that's very rare, but it does happen sometimes. So we retract about, well, you'll see about 200 and 220 articles a year, which works out, I think, more or less that the average is about one in 5,000 articles that, that we publish. But of course, you never really know, as Ted also mentioned, you don't know what articles you publish this year that are going to be retracted in the future, right? So it's quite difficult to judge. Um, and it has sort of leveled off. I think the Retraction Watch data also shows that, that the numbers of retractions are sort of leveling off. Um, so you can see, for example, last year we had sort of a bit of a spike. And the reason for that is um, because we focused on speeding up the implementation. Not the decision making, but the actual, you know, getting it on a platform and, and getting it through to Scopus and other clients. Um, and that also can, by doing that, then you can also increase the chance of mistakes. So all this sort of balance of trying to trying to get it right. 
I won't go into too much detail about this because Ted covered it with the larger data set. Um, but maybe um, a few things to mention are sort of new categories. So this is going over seven years of data. But for example, um, peer review manipulation, we didn't have a category for that, you know, six, seven years ago. Then we went, oh, right, mm -hmm. it's happening often enough, we need a category for it. Mm -hmm. um, things like that. Authorship disputes, um, we increasingly try to discourage retractions for authorship disputes. Um, the most crazy one I think we had was where the authors wanted to retract the paper because they were fighting over the order of the authors. And it's very rare, you know, as non-editors, it's very rare that Elsevier will say, you know, yeah, I don't think this retraction is a good idea. But in that case, we sort of said, look, also according to the code guidelines, um, you know, we don't think that's, that's a frivolous reason for a retraction. It was coming from the authors fighting amongst themselves, basically. So. So this is sort of our daily reality and how we how we manage it <coughs> is that um, everything that um, every every time someone wants to retract a paper, they have to send it to a panel of three people. So it's um, me, Jessica Alexander, who was mentioned here, Karen Brockahorse, my uh, my colleague, and my colleague Michal, who um, covers for me when I'm out. And this was established about 14 years ago. Our former legal counsel, um, Mark Seely, and I think we were very lucky that we had someone in a very senior position, you know, legal counsel, who found this topic very important, put a lot of time into it. He used to be on the panel, he checked everyone. He, he had a very strong belief in um, defending editors' decisions and basically accepting legal <coughs> risk. Um, to the point where sometimes he would be more quick to take the risk than I might think he would be. But that's the joy of being like the chief legal counsel, who can take those kind of risks, you know. So that's kind of been our background, I guess, that we've always been working in. That for us, we more often find that we're trying to persuade the editor, don't worry about the legal risk, it's on us, you know, we've got it, than, than the other way around. But every, every publisher can be different, of course. Um, so what we're looking for, so all these requests come to us, and what we're looking for is, I mean, in essence, is it fair, is it accurate, is it clear, right? Does it meet the code guidelines? Does it meet Elsevier's best practices? But in the end, <coughs> This is absolutely the editor's decision. So it's the editor's decision to retract. What we're looking at is, is the notice appropriate? But the decision to retract is the editor's. And it's very, very rare that we would question that. I mean, the example I gave would be very unusual, maybe once a year, perhaps. And we have, just to show you this behind the hood. So this, in Elsevier, this is called the tombstone process. So, you know, the article's gone, but there's something left that shows you where the article was. Um, and this is our process. And we basically are really strict with people. We're not popular. We're not popular. We're not getting presents at Christmas for this. I promise you. Yeah. So you're like, hey, you have to have informed the author. I know that sounds really obvious, but you'd be surprised. You have to have informed all the authors you can find, even if you have to go trolling Google to find their email addresses, contact all the authors. And you have to have sent them a copy of the retraction notice. Yeah. Not because we're going to let them you know, rewrite the notice, but just so they're informed, so they have a chance to at least um, say something. Um, also, we have we have templates. So it's kind of we're a bit sad that we have templates for everything that we do. We have templates. So, for example, you have to say who is requesting the retraction. Is it the author? Is it the editor? So I know that comes up as an issue a lot with um, investigations into retraction. It's not clear who 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 decided on the retraction. So we try to make that clear. And then we have um, because if you have enough things, you end up with templates. We have a template for a retraction for plagiarism, a template for a retraction for duplication, for peer review manipulation. And of course, the editors can do something else, and they often do. They often write their own notice and ignore the template, that's fine. But we find this is a way of also just, a lot of the anxiety that people have if they're doing with retraction the first time is all these unknowns. And that can inhibit people, that can slow things down, because the, you know they feel like, what do I say, and how do I say it, and what if they get sued, and there's all this kind of anxiety. And if you come along and say, okay, well, you know, we've done this before, here's the process, here's the template, it just, I think, for editors can help to take um, some, of, some of that nervousness away. So, um, so looking at 220 or something retractions a year, here are some of the things that we find comes up. And, of course, our, our goal is to try and solve these things before the retraction goes out into the world, but we don't always get it right, sometimes we miss things but this is what we try to look at. So as I said, the first thing is, have the authors been told? Is the notice informative enough? That's probably the most common reason we suggest changes to retraction notices. It just doesn't tell you enough. Sometimes it doesn't say 
anything. Sometimes it's like one sentence and we're like, no, sorry. So that's the main reason, it's just not informative enough. And often authors don't want it to be informative, of course, mm -hmm. right? And editors are nervous pushing back to the author and, you know, so we sort of empower people to say, no, it has to be more informative. Is it accurate? So one of the reasons you talked earlier um, about text recycling, and I noticed you've already mentioned, thankfully, self-plagiarism. I really hate the issue, the term self-plagiarism because the self gets dropped off. And then I get a retraction request that says it's plagiarism. And when I check, I realize, no, it's not, it's duplication. Yeah. But somebody calls it self-plagiarism and then the self gets dropped off and next thing you know, you're about to, you know, libel somebody, so it's fun. <laughs> um, are there links to supporting documents? So for example, the classic one is the Institute is on a report. And if the report is in the public domain, we try to link to that. Um, can you verify the claims? Which again, sounds kind of common sense, but you'd be surprised. Um, so we often get told, yeah, one person did everything. It was the postdoc. Mm -hmm. It was the only woman yeah. in the lab. It was the only foreigner in the lab. You know, you know, you, know, you all know the story, right? Um, and sometimes there is an email from that person saying, I acted alone, it was just me, no one do anything, it's all my fault. Um, and sometimes there isn't, it's just someone's word for it, right? So we're pretty meticulous about that. And honestly, sometimes even when I have the email from the person confessing everything and falling on their sword, I still doubt if it's yeah. true, but you know, yeah. there's only so far you can take it. And those are sort of the things at the front of our mind, let's say, and then there's all the things that are at the back of our mind, or at the back of my mind at least. And some of them are like, well, you know, the whole scapegoat scenario we just yeah. talked about. Yeah. What are we not being told? <laughs> so here's the author's explanation. What other explanations could there be that perhaps they're not mentioning? But sometimes they're super vague and you're like, mm, something else going on here. Like one was recently, we have a request where all the authors claim they didn't know anything about the paper, that it was submitted without their knowledge, none of them knew anything about it, and it's all fake email addresses. Oh. They're like, could be, you know, weird things happen in this business, but mm, probably not, but who knows. Is it libelous? And that's also why one of the people involved, Jessica, is a lawyer, so she can look at that quite easily. Um, and, you know, is it factual? It can't all be totally based on facts. Sometimes <laughs> the editor is making a scientific judgment call. Um, okay, it's based on facts but sometimes they are making judgment. You know, for example, the classic, the dog ate my USB stick, the raw data isn't available, and the editor has to make a call based on you know, limited information. And then the thing that's also at the back of my mind, which you know, there's also the talk, always talk about bad apples, and it's easy to kind of demonize people, but I also have a little bit in the back of my mind the situations like the very sad case um, of, um, in Japan of someone committing suicide after his student was found guilty um, and more cases like that, terrible stories, you know? And just being a little bit aware, in the end, we don't know what's going on, for sure, in these people's lives, and we don't know what impact this retraction will have. And we do get, you know, as you can see, <coughs> the phone calls and the emails saying we've destroyed people's careers. Mm -hmm. And, you know, not that that would stop us doing a retraction, but just in the back of our minds thinking, okay, be a little bit aware, mm -hmm. there's real life consequences for all of this. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the daily reality. Um, one minute, yeah, okay. Good, because these are the things I don't have asked for anyway, so that, will, <laughs> that makes it easy for me. Um, so one thing is kind of basic, and it's kind of ridiculous to even be mentioning it in 2019, but still we have some hangovers in our system and our processes that are kind of coming from print. You know, like we still kind of have articles in press, which we're all in the process of getting rid of that sort of stage. But we, so it's certain things that we do that don't really make sense in the online era, but we're just stuck with them until we get rid of some of these vestiges. Um, we talked about it a bit earlier with someone about citations and unreliable citations that have been put there because reviewers are stacking their CVs. And then, do we have a way to retract citations? Well, no, but you know, do we need one? Um, Embo um, just last week announced, um, Daniela Finelli talked about differentiating different types of retractions, self-retractions, withdrawals, and mm -hmm. should we think about that? Should we differentiate a bit more? Um, and then um, the whole question of retracted articles getting cited. And you might have heard of Retractobot that uh, Ben Goldacre is working on, um, but also looking at can we build that into the editorial process so when the paper is submitted, that the authors or the editor get an alert if it's citing a retracted paper. So some of the things we're thinking about. And I just wanted to thank Jessica and Karen and Miha, and especially Mark Seely, who really, for us, laid the groundwork for all of this and made it easy for us to continue this work. Thank you.